happy open chat Friday. How you guys doing? Hey, it's great to see you. Look good, there. Good morning. I will let anybody on this podcast. Isn't it? Isn't it fantastic? Yeah. How yeah. you doing, my brother? Well, I got my I got my coffee. I'm good. I have coffee articles in case it comes up. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're new to the podcast and you're not sure what this is all about, leave. You can ask. We will interact with you on Open Chat Friday. You can ask us any questions about God, about the Bible. I'll bet you money we've got the answer you're looking for. I'll bet you money. Well, I don't. I don't know if I could bet money on that, that but that, that's it. I, hey, I'll. I'll, I'll um, we yeah, have yeah. the answers to all the important questions, mm-hmm. and I dare you to stump the preachers. <laughs> um, it might not be that hard. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, 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 okay, I have. Um, Oh, let's see here. I do have a couple of funny, uh, a couple of things to show. Um, I forgot to set this up here. We have, um, well, let me set this up real quick. We have. I thought you said you were ready. I was, but I don't know. I get distracted easily. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Uh, if anybody's interested, first of all, over at Supply Grace, I have, it's a two for one Friday. I have two big yeah. articles. Mm. One on <laughs> freaky locusts with stingers, <laughs> and then another one on two hundred million fiery horses from heaven, yeah. talking about the final trumpet judgments. Mm. And uh, so, check that out. Now, I also have a hilarious article that made me laugh last night. The there has been an item that has uh, come up on a number of Christian news sites that has had people laughing. And it's a pink sweater. Have you seen this? <laughs> uh, you know Stephen Furtick, Elevation Church yeah. in North Carolina. This yeah. is this is the guy uh, for whom uh, the 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 phrase uh, narcissus was invented. <laughs> narcissus, right? Which is a combination of narcissism and exegesis, in which you. You turn everything around to be all about you. And on, on Easter, it was particularly bad. You know, Easter, if you know, if you want to see someone make Jesus' resurrection story all yeah. about you, right. you know, Stephen Ferdy, like, you know, like where his grave represents your depression and failure, you know, and Galilee represents a better life you want to live, you know, that, that kind of garbage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, for the record, I love Stephen Furtick, as I would love any unbeliever, any lost soul. <laughs> now, but Stephen yeah. Furtick, what eclipsed this um, really bad sermon on Easter Sunday was his pink sweater. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Furtick mocked mercilessly for wearing a two thousand dollar oversized sweater for his Easter sermon. Look at this. Look at this thing. Look at that sweater. You might look good in that. My grandmother. Well, I almost wore pink on Easter. <laughs> I've got a pink, a pink dress shirt. Yeah. Oh, it's hilarious. Yeah. I love this thing. And, and nothing I wear is baggy anymore. You know, people are like, well, my grandmother's been looking for this sweater, that sort of thing. <laughs> but the funny thing is Babylon B is all over this. <laughs> Babylon B. Stephen Ferdy debuts new line of chastity wear. <laughs> Guard your virginity forever. <laughs> oh, uh, no. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Based on the response to his Easter sweater, megachurch pastor Stephen Ferdy announced today that he would be releasing a line of chastity wear guaranteed to keep members of the opposite sex at a very, very safe distance. <laughs> Oh uh, well, have you been? Yeah, well, now I see. You're talking. About, this is Babylon B. No yeah, wonder Babylon oh, B. Right. Okay. Have I, you been looking for wardrobe yeah. options that will ensure no human being will ever want to be intimate with you? Well, look no further. Exclaimed Ferdick. <laughs> Donning a torn pink garbage bag, these clothes are like a cheat code for virtue. <laughs> <laughs> you know me. Oh. The new clothing line will feature both men and women's apparel, 
designed for the sole purpose of repelling anyone <laughs> who could conceivably be attracted to the wearer. <laughs> the clothing line will also offer tailoring options to ensure that no item comes anywhere close to remotely fitting. <laughs> Each purchase will come with a money-back guarantee that the wearer will never, ever experience any sort of romantic interest whatsoever. <laughs> That's the greatest Babylon Bee article ever. According to sources, Furtick launched the clothing line after realizing it could make him an enormous amount of money and might plausibly give something to do with have, might possibly have something to do with Jesus. The shirts will cost two thousand dollars and come with a vaguely inspirational card that may or may not have anything to do with the Bible. <laughs> At publishing time, customers had reported the clothing line to be incredibly effective at maintaining chastity as well as frightening small children. <sighs> how do they come that up with made this? my day how do they come up with this that stuff made my life oh, i'm oh. telling you these guys yeah. yeah uh now for the record i love stephen furtick and i hope he gets saved and comes into the knowledge of the truth uh okay there was another controversy i didn't think i'd get my, much mileage out of that there was another controversy involving caffeine <laughs> can caffeine be harmful to a christian's spiritual life this Calvinist has an answer for you. How could it be harmful for my spiritual life if God ordained that I drink it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking. Uh, so there was a listener on a podcast asked John Piper if uh, he said that uh, caffeinated drinks were controversial in our youth group. There are reasons to be concerned about some caffeinated soda beverages, I think yeah. that garbage will kill you. Yeah. I think it's just awful stuff. Yeah. Coffee, you know. And uh, so this guy named Jose asked John Piper, as someone who likes them, I was wondering if there are any negative effects or reason to not drink on them. They help me focus and have energy during my work shift. I only drink one every two or three days, but I would like to have some spiritual insight in order that I might run this race without being slowed Wait. down. <laughs> Running the race has nothing to do with caffeine, caffeine. my brother. <laughs> uh, uh, so as part of his response, Piper went to 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and 13, read this version that was so butchered, uh, it hardly, would hardly even be recognizable to us. So I'll just um, read it in a King James. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Okay. So... Um, uh, it says, so the body matters to God morally, and in particular, foods matter and sex matters. How would foods matter to God when he has given you basically liberty to eat what you want so long as you thank him? I don't, I don't know. Sex matters. Yes, yeah. that's very important. Absolutely, mm -hmm. sex matters. Yeah. And so the guidelines he gives matters. It's amazing to me. He says mm -hmm. guidelines here. I'll mm -hmm. give him credit for that. Piper added that the question was part of a much bigger issue, specifically a question about the proper use of not just caffeine, but other stimulants and medications. Okay. Are energy drinks or whatever I'm taking, are they masking deeper problems that I'm not dealing with <laughs> because I'm masking them or are they helping me really address and be freed from the deeper problems that I may have? <laughs> What are you talking about? <laughs> if Jose or any of us is masking deeper problems with stimulants. Now, I understand masking problems with stimulants. Um, you know, yeah. I'm, I've am i masked a lot of problems with alcohol, but a stimulant? Yeah. I, well, alcohol is not a stimulant. Exactly. It's, so it's I, I don't know what he's talking about here. <laughs> yeah. Then they're not being used as a gift from God for our good. They're being used as a flight from truth and from the good that God wants to do deeper down. What are you talking about? Am I missing something? It's very possible yeah. the problem could be me, yeah. and I'm missing something. But I don't, what are you talking about here? It's coffee. You know why I drink coffee? Cheers. <laughs> yeah. I like coffee. 
Exactly. I, I like the way I, I like the way it tastes. Exactly. I, I can't say that I get a. I've never gotten a buzz off the of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever drink coffee because you desperately needed it to help wake up? No. No. Oh. oh, I have done that. No. Well, I say that. I did have a job where I started at two or three every day and went to, you know, 11 or 12 at night. And yeah, I would drink coffee. Copious coffee. Yep. I sometimes I'll have a bad night of sleep and I'll drink a lot of coffee in the morning to get, yeah. to get yeah. going. Yeah. Um, well, you're kind of dead anyway. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Piper yeah. says, if Jose or any of us is masking deeper problems with stimulants. Oh, I already read that. Well, can you? Uh, okay, so I drink coffee. So now I'm supposed to think about why why I drink coffee. <laughs> Am I masking some deep moral <laughs> or spiritual deficiency in in my life uh, because I'm drinking coffee? Instead of analyzing why you're drinking coffee, why not just study scripture and analyze your life well, that I way? I was going to say. I mean, if I'm going <laughs> to if I'm going to if I'm going to approach life that way, you know, <laughs> I'm going to ask myself why I do everything. Right. You know, right. Before I do I, anything, do I need to sit down and analyze it and make sure that I'm not doing it for some secret? Un, okay. Un here's, you know, I, here's, here's okay. Here's a, here's a theory. Okay. So let's say you're having sleeping issues and you're drinking coffee, but you're not addressing the sleeping issue. That you have. Okay. That maybe maybe that, well, that might be. But that I would call that, that common sense. Right. But that's not, that may, sleeping issues may not necessarily be a spiritual issue either. No. You no. know? So it's not like, no. you know, you're not, if you're not sleeping, you're not right with God. You know, yeah. that's not necessarily the case at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, all right. So let's see here. Yeah. There's all kinds of reasons for not sleeping. Um, I have a box of energy drinks in my office. He says, if I've, Got a pressing task and I cannot stay awake. Yes, I'll go there. Well, if you can't stay awake <laughs> yeah. and you got a pressing task, mm -hmm. what's your spiritual issue, John Piper? Yeah. <laughs> Which is yeah. why you're so sleepy. Yeah. If my real problem is that John Piper doesn't have the discipline to go to bed at night and therefore get six hours instead of eight hours of sleep, I, I couldn't. I, six hours, I, th I thrive off of six hours. And therefore, he's always falling asleep at his task. And thus, he resorts to an artificial stimulant that's masking, that's hiding, that's running away from mm -hmm. God. Well, if you're not sleeping, it doesn't necessarily mean you're having an issue with God. Mm -hmm. I don't. I just don't get that connection at all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, again, I wouldn't. I wouldn't call coffee an artificial stimulant. Yeah. I mean the the cocoa leaves of uh, the, the natives chewed it. You know, it's. They got the benefit from it right straight from the leaf. So, <laughs> yeah, the uh, uh, Afri I think the Africans uh, used to eat those cherries that the beans came in yeah. uh, before they went to war because it gave them, it, it, it stimulated them. Yeah, it yeah, woke it them up, got them all pumped yeah. up. Yeah. yeah, I think that's how they discovered coffee. So I had heard mm. um, there were people who had reactions to this, which was sort of interesting. Uh, Christian headlines. This guy says, well, as a pastor myself with a background in health and fitness, I'd like to add a few important facts on how it affects spiritual health. He's let's begin with anger and irritability. <laughs> Why are so many Christians angry and irritable? Because they drink coffee. Bad doctrine. <laughs> Bad doctrine. They don't know if they're going to lose their salvation. Maybe God's mad at them, you know. They don't, they don't know who they are in Christ. They don't yeah. know how anything works. Bad doctrine is probably yeah. what makes them irritable more so than the coffee. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's because most are addicted to something that is harming them. Addiction to caffeine. Now, an addiction is a different matter altogether. Yeah. I would never um, advocate an addiction to anything except maybe ministry. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that is easy to do. Uh, addiction to caffeine, for example, often fuels angry temper tantrums and explosive outbursts. It's a powerful stimulant that fuels irritability and a quick temper. I don't know. I think the word now, of God could see, be there's nice. This, there's that broad sweeping statement. With, where's any evidence of that? Uh, That's an opinion. I agree. A constant state of stress. Yeah. Coffee, 
Um, opposing the fruit of the spirit. <laughs> Drinking coffee will have you yeah. opposing the fruit of the spirit. Yeah. Uh, in other words, be not <laughs> be not drunk with wine. Is do not be stimulated by coffee, coffee. but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Is that? And then is, he has at the yeah. end here why quitting is a nightmare. If you can avoid empty foods and limit caffeine and junk food consumption, you'll be well on your way to better health. Well, yeah, junk food, uh, sure. Empty yeah. foods, yeah. eat some healthy foods, do everything in moderation. I'm all for that. Yeah. Common sense. Uh, does anybody have any thoughts about that? Yeah. I do have this really old article here uh, from Esquire that was about addiction to coffee that I we talked about years ago on the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I'll put that in the live chat if anyone's interested. Um, it's, it's interesting to me a lot of times that the people that are, are, are down on people that drink coffee and, and accuse them of being addicted to coffee and you take, and you look at the individuals and it's obvious sometimes that they're either addicted to food or addicted to sugar or, or addicted to something themselves. Again, that's just another way of believers, uh, judging other believers for their, their behavior. Yeah. Uh, when so, their behavior is really the same. Uh, I love it. I couldn't agree more. And yeah. finally, I'll close with this. Uh, BBI Bulletin. Uh, Carl was like, well, who are these blokes? Yeah. <laughs> uh, BBI, that's a um, basically online institute uh, that uh, does mid-acts. Um, and uh, there's, the McGarveys are connected to it. The Matt Ritchie. Uh, I have an affection. An, uh, affection for Ed Bedor simply because I love I had fallen in love with reading his articles in these bulletins and uh, he's the one who had initially introduced me to uh, in, uh, identification and he really he gets identification really well uh, so he has this, um, some articles here that I really enjoyed uh, the one on um, redemption was great the means of redemption uh, he said uh, redemption means to set free by paying a required price, especially a ransom. Yep. And uh, I looked it up in Webster's 1828. He's absolutely right. That's yep. a great, that what he, what he gave yep. was a great definition. Yep. It is related to the Roman slave market where a slave would be placed for sale and a purchaser, a redeemer could pay the price demanded to set the slave free. The mm -hmm. apostle Paul used the term in regard to the believers release from the bondage of sin. Mm -hmm. The apostle also shows us that the payment for redemption was the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ. Blood is associated with his death on the cross. In mm. fact, it is so closely associated that the words death and blood are sometimes used interchangeably in regard to the Lord Jesus's redemptive work on the cross. Yeah. The offering of himself as a substitute to bear the wrath of God mm -hmm. that our sins deserve. Love that. Yeah. I, I, I was that was well well put together. I really, I really love that. Um, I love what he had to say, uh, uh, making uh, connections with the blood. He goes through uh, references to the blood in Paul's epistles here. He says, in reference to Jesus Christ's redemptive work on the cross, the blood is most significant. It is identified as his blood a number of times. Acts 20, 28, Romans 3, 5, Ephesians 1, Colossians 1, the blood of Christ. And the blood of the cross, Colossians 1.20. The writer of Hebrews and the apostles Peter and John also speak of Christ's blood in conjunction with his work of redemption on behalf of Adam's fallen race. He talks about how some people uh, would downplay the blood, but the blood is essential. Uh, he says, uh, death and blood are not mutually exclusive terms, but each supposes the other, and yeah. both suppose the cross. Right. Mm -hmm. And he, Philippians 2.8, he cites for that. You know, being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death yeah. of the cross. Yeah. And then he talks about the importance of redemption, or the uh, resurrection. Yeah. As important as Jesus Christ's death on the cross 
was to God's plan of redemption, it does not stand alone. Equally right. important is his resurrection, right. which shows him to be the son of God with power. And he says a dead savior could never intercede on behalf of sinners. Each believer can have absolute assurance that they will never face everlasting condemnation for their sins because it is Christ that died. Right. Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is ever at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Romans 8, 34. Mm -hmm. And he just says, praise him, praise him forever. Praise him. I love that. I love that. Yeah. He says the salvation or deliverance of a sinner who trusts in Christ for forgiveness of his or her sins has several aspects. With mm -hmm. While each aspect is distinct from the others, they cannot be separated from each other. They might be likened to the different colors of yarn that are woven into a beautiful design mm -hmm. in a tapestry. If you pulled one of them mm -hmm. out, the whole thing would be ruined. Mm -hmm. The redemption price must be paid so that the wow. sinners can be forgiven of their sins. Yeah. They must be identified with Jesus Christ in his death. Right where they are cleansed of their sins and redeemed by his precious blood. Being forgiven of their sins and redeemed from the bondage of sin, they are no longer at enmity with God, but at peace, reconciled with him. And because they've been identified with Christ in his death, they are also identified with him in both his resurrection and righteousness and are declared just in God's sight. And given the gift of eternal life, they are at the same time sanctified in Christ. That's, that that too is is well said. I really I really yeah. enjoyed that. Yeah. And then at, towards the end here, he makes a, a he he writes a list. Um, he says in Romans three. 23 to 26, the Apostle Paul ties justification, redemption, and propitiation together as being received through faith in Christ's blood. Right. Propitiation speaks of reconciliation as it relates to God's wrath being appeased towards sinners who place their right. faith in Christ's blood. Romans 4, Paul links righteousness, forgiveness, and justification together. Romans 5, 1, he ties justification to peace with God. Romans 5, 8 to 11, we find Christ's death coupled to reconciliation under the umbrella of salvation. In 1 Corinthians 1.20, we find righteousness, sanctification, and redemption connected. connected. In 2 Corinthians 5.18-21, we have reconciliation and righteousness directly linked. In Ephesians 1, 6 and 7, the apostle puts the believer's acceptance by God in Christ, reconciliation, redemption, and the forgiveness of sins together as part of the package of the salvation that one has through faith in Christ and his blood. I loved how he did that, mm -hmm. Derek, connecting those different concepts in those verses. Yeah. That was that was that was really, really beautiful. Uh, so I have a link beneath the video to uh, the new BBI bulletin. And uh, so check that out. Read his wonderful uh, article on redemption. That was that's a great that was a great read. I give him tons of credit for that. Does you have any reactions to that? Yeah, sounded very good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, by the way, this is the Grace Life Podcast, and we are your mad, bad brothers in Christ. Mad in the sense of mid-acts dispensational, bad in the sense of blessed and delivered. I'm some guy named Joel. This is Harold Leroy Beckemeyer Jr., the Obi-Wan of the Grace Movement. And we are your flight attendants this morning for Flight 777 of Titus 213 Airlines, ready to take off at a moment's notice. We're watching the countdown to the showdown of Armageddon, and we're going to party like it's Revelation 19.9. Hey, <laughs> hey, we got a bunch of links beneath the video. There's a link to this thing here, Empowered by His Grace, which is all about what God made you in Christ. All about that identification thing that Ed Bedore was writing about in his article. I loved uh, if you want more information, if you've never heard that expression before, you want to know more, hey, that book's for you. It's all about Romans 6, who, knowing who you are in Christ. And uh, you can get it $14 at Dispensational Publishing House, or you, you could uh, just download a free PDF from our church's website. So check it out. Hey, let's see who's in the house here. Damon Chin, what's going on, my brother? He says, good morning, saints, and to our mad, bad brothers after the common faith for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. God is faithful. 
by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord. Notice how it's God the Father is faithful there. Mm -hmm. I do yeah. have an outline on the faithfulness of the whole triune Godhead. I'm, yeah. One of these days I'm going to preach that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that concept. Hope you're doing well, man. How's your family? Yeah. How's your wife? I hope all's good. Hey, John Snodgrass is here. Good morning and praise God. I am so ready for this. First Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Uh, I'm do so glad that next verse is there. 24. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's okay to pray that the God of peace, for me to pray that the God of peace will sanctify Hal Beckemeyer holy <laughs> and that his whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. Right. Well, do you get the indication that's something you pray for someone else or something you pray for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> do you need to, I mean, you don't need to be, I mean, if you want to be sanctified holy, and then he talks about spirit and soul and body, he's got to be talking about your walk. Yeah. That it's your walk that's set apart. Uh, right. Well, we see that all the way through Paul's epistles. If there is a, a common theme, it is the walk of the believer. And the preserved blameless would be uh, not just what you do and how you do it, but also the inner motivation, the right. motivation of the inner man in doing what you're doing. It's obviously so it's the, not, the blamelessness yeah. is in the entire spirit, soul, body. Right. It's not positional there. It's practical. Right. And then it gets positional when he says, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. He will set you apart in this. If you study his yeah. word, apply his word to your life, he will absolutely set your life apart. But, uh, also the one who calls you will do exactly what he said he will do. When he offered you the uh, free gift of eternal life, that moment he called you. The calling of God, he calls you through the gospel. That's another Thessalonian verse somewhere. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse Something. 13, maybe. That, yeah, that sounds right. Second Thessalonians 2, 13. Uh uh, 14, 14, where unto he called you by our gospel yeah. to the obtaining of the glory yeah. of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you got to read verse 13. <laughs> we are bound to give thanks all way to God for you, brethren, beloved of the yeah. Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you, you to, to salvation, salvation through, through sanctification of the spirit, spirit and, and belief, belief of the of truth, truth. where unto he called, called you, you by our gospel yeah. to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. So there's the key of the gospel in there and the, and the, and the uh, connection with faith, everything that we receive, right. The benefit of by faith. Well, and the Calvinists would say, well, chosen you to salvation. Oh no, 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 no. That no. verse continues through yeah. Yeah. two things, right. sanctification of the spirit and, and the belief of the, the truth. truth. Right. Contrary to the suggestion that it teaches unconditional election. <laughs> it teaches right. that election is conditional. Right. You get the same sense when you read Ephesians chapter 1. Right, right. And then you have this glorious expression in verse 14 where he called you by our gospel. So the yeah. gospel is the means by which he calls you. A yeah. calling is just God expressing mm -hmm. his will for your life, something he wants you to do. And he just wants everybody to do the same in the age of grace. Get saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Right. And he calls you by the gospel. Right. He, he, through, the gospel is the means by which he reveals to you his will for your life. And in this verse, his will for your life is to obtain the glory of a son. Yeah. It's a, that's amazing. I just find the end of that verse still jaw dropping in mm. the sense that you're called by the gospel and mm. what he is what his will is is that he wants you to have the glory of his son. Mm. 
Well, that. That's amazing. That. And then I think of Ephesians 4.1 in the same context, hmm. where he says, um, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. What vocation, what calling are we called with? He doesn't say the vocation where to you are called. It says mm. wherewith you're called. He's talking about the gospel. Mm. That's our, that's the vocation wherewith we are called. And he beseeches us that we would have a life that is worthy of that. Well, if you're going to quote Ephesians 4, one and talk about our vocation, then I have to ask you, what's the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ? <laughs> <laughs> that would be... And I would assume in, in the practical sense, that would be absolutely choosing almost all the time, if not all the time, to walk according to the life of Christ that's in us and our identification with him. So you're saying the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ is the standard of a worthy walk? Yeah. Galatians yeah. 2, 20 and 21. Um, there you go. I hope you felt like you got your money's worth, John. It is great to see you. It's great to have you here, brother. Davey's in the house. I know there was a question about death or something, at the, and it has somehow and it, disappeared. And it we disappeared. Didn't, we didn't. We didn't d delete it or anything. You're you're welcome to ask that question if you want. Maybe you changed your mind. I think sometimes if you ask a question early, uh, YouTube deletes all the early comments in the live chat when you get close to going live. Yeah. Um, so we'll still answer that. I'll just say this, when it comes to death, the first verse that came to mind is it's appointed unto man once to die, yeah. and after this, the judgment. Yeah. But then the question would be, which death is he talking about? Right. Well, I think the question was, at least in part as I remember it, is does the soul die? And oh, did he ask that? I, I, okay. There's All something, right. of, you know, when a, when a person dies, I mean, we're presented as a trichotomy, spirit, soul, and Body. And, and body, what is it that dies? Well, we know the body dies. Uh, that's consistent. Uh, he said, uh, for the dust returneth to the dust as it was, and the spirit goeth back to God that gives it. And right. so there, uh, there's the, the temporal portion of our existence, which is this physical body. This is the thing that Paul called a, a tabernacle. He called it a tent. And he suggests in, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, that, that this thing gets dissolved. For if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, he said, we have a building not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And he said, that's what we're waiting. You know, he said, as long as we're in this body, we're burdened. We're, we look forward to being clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. Well, okay, if... if if this is dust, it goes back to dust. It's dissolved, and we've got a new building. So we realize that that's, that's the uh, temporal part of our existence. Well, what's going to live in this new body? And uh, I, I would suggest that it's the soul and, and, and the spirit. And, and it's interesting. Uh, uh, Hebrews 4 talks about the, the dividing asunder of, of soul and spirit, uh, and the joints and the marrow, a three-way separation, if you will, the, the soul, the spirit, and, and, and the body. They're all broken up. Uh, in Scripture, the soul always goes down to Sheol. The, the, the spirit goes back to God that gives it. The, the body goes back to dust, and God's got this marvelous operation he's going to perform when he he, he doesn't need that tin anymore. He's going to give us a a, a, a tabernacle, a, a building, eternal, you know, building. that's eternal yeah. in the heavens. Yeah. In order to have eternal life and enjoy eternal life, would that not suggest that we need an eternal body yeah. building to live in? Yeah. And that's the reason it'll be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Just imagine how happy your soul will be. Oh, I can't, I can't body. imagine. Can't, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Yeah. Uh, Toby, I hope, uh, so if you still, if if we missed it or we were off about anything and you still mm -hmm. want to ask that question, David, you're welcome to. We we have no problem answering that. Yeah. Uh, Toby is in the house. How you doing, brother? It's great to see you. What's the word? 
My dear brother, Bob, is going to try to join us today. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I love me some Bob Picard. We were just talking about how, yeah. man, we were <laughs> beginning was just like, who's this Bob Picard guy? Man, this guy's. Mm. And then I listened to the first sermon I listened to of him. And uh, he's talking about how the old mm. man is D-E-A-D -E dead. Mm. I laughed my head off. I told Mike, I said, Mike, come out here. You got to hear this Bob Picard guy. Yeah. He's fantastic. And uh, Mike me instantly loved him. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, well, and, but, and Hal actually preached at his church once. Yes, I did. Yeah. It, it, I don't know why it just popped into my mind. You know they're coming out with a Sasquatch movie. There, there are a number of them, and I tell Brian uh, about all of them. Oh, but, no, <laughs> but, but this one, this one, uh, they're now doing. Uh, what do they call them when they have private viewings ahead of time to see how the audience is going oh, to? Oh yeah, receive. test screenings. It, I test think they're test screenings in the test screenings. Uh, Apparently, a, a large number got up and walked out. <laughs> they found the movie so disgusting. <laughs> they never, they never, um, yeah. they, they never, uh, ha, uh, there has never been a good uh, a, a mm -hmm. yeah. Bigfoot Sasquatch yeah. movie. I yeah. have actually seen a lot of the free ones yeah. on Tubi, yeah. and they're yeah. hilariously yeah. bad. I, I, I will. I, I need to tell Brian yeah. about more of them. Yeah. Well, I will tell you this. I did challenge Bob in his own pulpit. <laughs> I asked oh, him at right. point by are you are you Bigfoot? Yeah. And he didn't deny it. I have a theory it's Dennis Young. That's yeah. that's my theory now. Yeah. I don't I'm I'm convinced I think Bob likes to play, you know, play be coy mm. about it so there would mm. be suspicion. Yeah. I think it's Dennis Young yeah. doing it. I, I'm I'm telling yeah. that's a Dennis thing. He would totally do yeah. that. Well, I think basically he said, you're not going to believe me either way. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So people are wondering why your grace podcast, mid ax dispensation, why Bigfoot? Well, because years ago when I had Brian on the first time I had him on, mm -hmm. uh, Brian Ross, and I asked him if there was a guilty pleasure or something like that. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, well, yesterday I watched a Bigfoot documentary with my dad. <laughs> 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 or something like that. Something like that. And uh, <laughs> I have been sending yeah. him Bigfoot memes for years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yes. And people send me stickers yeah. to put on my laptop. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's hilarious. I still say the classic Bigfoot movie was, what was it? Harry and the Hendersons? John Lithgow, oh, played, yeah. played, John, yeah. John Lithgow played the, yeah. the Sasquatch. I, uh, I, I did see that movie. I don't remember it at it all. It was hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in a writing group, I had an outline for a Yeti story. Really? Yeah, and it's it was it was uh, it was at the time that the um, the uh, um, Patriot Act came out, and so yeah. basically a guy lost his brother to a Yeti, so he flies out to N Nepal. Uh, and he goes to this small town and there's all this surveillance everywhere and everybody had these curfews mm -hmm. and everything. And, uh, and, uh, basically the, the Yeti was an excuse to bring about unlimited surveillance on their own people was the point of the story, but there was a big old Yeti yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he was scary. Yeah. Uh, I read, uh, the research I did at the time, I read actual Yeti books, books, mm -hmm. of people writing about Yetis. Yeah. I love Yetis. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, we got uh, side uh, sidetracked there. Ludis, our sweet sister down there, Puerto fault. Rico. Good to see you. Huh? That was my fault. That was my fault too. That was my fault. Hey, Larry and Colin, great to see you. Wet and raining up there. One faith, one Lord, one Bible. I love it. I love it. Robert Craig's in the in the in the in the house also, my dear brother. Good to see you. Uh, yes, I would love to hear it. Um, good morning, uh, everybody. Go for broke. <laughs> hey, it's Derek. Are you telling me it's Derek Patterson? My dear, beautiful brother, how are you? Hey. We've been praying for you, my yes, man. Yes, we have. And uh, we love you to death. It is so great to hear from you. And uh, you keep on keeping on, my yeah. dear brother. Yeah, we should have you. You could answer all these questions, yeah. Derek, my beautiful man. I hope your family's doing well. Give them all. Uh, a love and a hug mm. and a kiss from me and how that means two for everybody. Uh, question as saints saved by grace, ought we keep the law though we are not under it? I love that question. That is a fantastic question. There, um, 
I'll let Pastor Howell do that. Well, I'll bet he's going to go to First Timothy one. How did you? How did you? <laughs> yeah. I yeah. can read your mind. I have spent yeah. so much time with you, Hal. Uh, more often than not, I can guess pr- with, pr- with some good accuracy w- what your answer is going to be, where you're coming yeah. from. And every once in a while, you you, you throw me, yeah. but it doesn't happen yeah. as often anymore. So when I leave in two weeks, you won't miss me at all. I could be uh, if you left in two weeks. When you if you leave in two weeks, I'm still holding out on the fact you're going to stay for the whole summer. But if you if you uh, leave in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what I would do is, well, if Hal were here, I can tell you he would say this. And I, I guarantee you that's accurate 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. I, I can tell people what you'd say. But, yeah, he's going to go to First Timothy 1, which, mm-hmm. which in and of itself is an amazing set of passages here that Paul would have to explain this about the law to Timothy, who was a pastor at Ephesus at the yeah. time. They had fallen so far from grace. Yeah. Paul had to explain the point of the law. Yeah. Well, I don't think he's explaining it to Timothy. I think he's, for the saints at the church, exactly. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And it's interesting. You look at that phrase. You have to question. All right, so Paul is charging Timothy because there are those that are teaching another doctrine. Well, other than what? Well, obviously, other than the doctrine that Paul taught Timothy, since Timothy was his his uh, student and co-apostle. Uh, and so this other doctrine that he's referring to is the law. He said, don't give heed to fables, endless genealogies. They minister questions rather than godly edifying, pying, which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity. Well, again, we're always going to go to character. It, it's not a, just about doctrine. It's also about character out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Well, that's an interesting comparison. So you've got character, you've got motivation, and you've got an established mind that's been renewed in in sound doctrine. And he says, from which some having swerved had turned aside unto vain jangling. So if if they're... (laughs) If they're teaching another doctrine, which is the law, he says this this is vain jangling. Amen. And 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 in case there's any question about what he means by that uh, metaphor, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. He says, see there, there's a lawful use of the law. Yes. Yes, there is a lawful use of the law. But the lawful use of that law is founded on one established fact, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. <laughs> and That's so, right. you know, anytime, I, and, uh, you know, I hear all of these discussions. I, I used to be challenged with it somewhat. I haven't heard much of it lately, but. You know, people will say, well, you know, aren't there principles in the law that are, as we would say, transdispensational, and shouldn't we live after the law? And I have one question. Are you righteous? Amen. Amen. Are you righteous? Amen. I love that. And if, yeah. and if they can't answer in yeah. the affirmative or, or they scratch their head and try and understand what I mean by that, yep. it tells me there's a lot of basic Pauline doctrine that they do not understand, particularly their identification in Christ, uh, uh, our life in Christ, our life through the Spirit being established in the principles of the grace of God, all of those things, you should resoundingly say, are you you righteous? The question should be yes. Now, the uh, the motivation is entirely different, too, because, you know, you had to do this on what the law tells you or else. There were consequences to not fulfilling right. the law. So the uh, yeah. attitude is, well, how much of this do I have to do in order to fulfill my requirements under the law? Yeah. Now that the law has been fulfilled in Christ, yeah. we uh, do much of the same things, not as to fulfill a requirement in order to avoid mm-hmm. a consequence. We do it out of mm-hmm. uh, re- out of um, gratitude for what has already been done mm-hmm. for us. Yeah. And it's not just, well, how much do I have to do in order to fulfill this mm. this obligation? Mm. It is, you know, how much more can I do 
above and beyond anything that might even be expected because of my endless gratitude for what's already been done for us. Um, well, now, yeah, I was going to think. Oh, go ahead, Pastor. Um, <laughs> another verse I just thought of in that context. Um, we talk about Colossians 2 all the time because there's so much in there. But in that, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Well, what does the law do? Right. The, the law condemns our sin. It points right. out our sin. It's the microscope for, for pointing out our failures in, in the flesh. He says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. If he nailed the law to the cross, why in the world would we want to take any of it right. and try and make it work in our life? That's right. That's right. And, you know, so how would you, and here's another question. You had talked about transdispensational principles yeah. here. How do you know what is a timeless principle in the law and what isn't Paul's epistles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the only way you'll know what, right. what's a timeless principle or not. Does it line up with anything you've already read in Paul's epistles? Then it's a timeless principle. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, and uh, there is. Um, well, that's the other I, thing that I would say. The other thing is the law teaches a great deal of of information through through type. And not so much always the substance. Mm -hmm. And Paul comes along, he does away with some of the typology and, and, you know, this is the substance, you know? So, you know, uh, what is the fulfilling of the law according to the apostle Paul? All right. Didn't you say it was charity? Um, yeah, exactly. Love, love with your heart, mind, soul, yeah. body, every yeah. ounce of your being love. Yeah. And that yeah. was everything hung mm -hmm. off of that principle. Right. So yeah. there, so principally, you'll you'll see, yeah. Uh, yeah. You, and so when you have that principle at work in the details of your life, then you're going to see a lot of that principle, those principles yeah. in some of the laws. But yeah. you know, it should be natural yeah. to us operating on on right. love toward everybody without yeah. needing a law to right. tell us the details of how to accomplish it. Well, the law would tell us to do it, but it didn't. It didn't provide anything to enable us to do it. Yeah. Whereas right. the Lord Jesus Christ and our life in Christ, by being filled with the Spirit, walking after the Spirit, we manifest the fruit of the Spirit. The very first fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, yeah. peace, long-suffering. So if the Holy Spirit, we yield to Him, walk in Him, why in the world will we need uh, a, a list to follow? I remember years ago I did a message on Torah observant Christians. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, all of our uh, messages are also uploaded or uh, copied over at Odyssey. And that was on Odyssey, one of my most hated uh, sermons I ever did. It really got some some uh, nasty comments, I remember. But at one point of the sermon, I've quoted everything Paul said about the law, starting in Galatians 4.20. Mm -hmm. Tell me, Ye that desire to be under the law, oh, wow. do you mm -hmm. not hear the law? Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under, under the, the law, law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty, guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no, no flesh, flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge no, of the sin. sin. Mm -hmm. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Mm -hmm. For what the law say, for what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, mm -hmm. that the righteous of righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Yep. Yep. It's it's really, it's really not that hard to 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 understand what he's saying. Uh, the law by the law is the knowledge of sin. I, I like the analogy of, of it, it becomes a microscope. You know what a microscope is. It, mm. it you look into the unseen world, so to speak. You see those things that are hidden. Well, there's there's nothing hidden uh, from the eyes of God. No one would ever suggest that in discovering disease 
that needed to be treated through using a microscope that you would consume the microscope in order <laughs> to to cure the disease. Right. And and that's what the law is. There there's no cure there. It it it's it's a microscope. It shows us that. Um, and, and and besides we have the declaration, you know, uh, for sin shall not have dominion over you because right. we're not under the law but under grace. Amen. Uh, Chandler is in the house. He says, that looks like a green pepper out of my garden. I'm guessing he might be talking about Stephen Furtick's sweater, maybe an early version of the green pepper before it matures, ripens. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, hey, Norma Garcia, yeah. how you doing? Oh, okay. So Davey posted the question here. Um, in the teaching, we are made of three parts, and all parts must experience a death in turn are dead in order to comprehend the understanding of Pauline doctrine you position in heaven. Um, sounds like there might be more. Let me look down here. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that I understand that question. Um, I'll just say, how about this? We'll talk about death in the sense of... Um, you know, there. I'd say I probably a lot of teachers would say that death is one is the physical body, and you also have an eternal death. And well, they would say there's two deaths, but there was always really one kind of death in Scripture, mm -hmm. and that was separation from God. Mm -hmm. it, the, the The death of the body is merely a consequence of that separation of God that already that mm -hmm. you've already that already had. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, you had the first, uh, talk of death with Adam, mm -hmm. you know, in the day that he would eat that fruit, he would die. Mm -hmm. Well, he lived to be 900 years old. So how yeah. was, how did that work? It was death in the sense of the second death, the eternal separation from God, yeah. it was, unless atonement or some kind of reconciliation is made for that sin, sin mm -hmm. separates you from God. And in God's eyes, even though our souls are going to live on for eternity, mm. your soul is dead because you're separated from, you're cut off from his life. Right. That is death. To not be connected with him, to not be one with him, that's death mm. because you're separated from him. Right. Well, um, another meaning of death is it's, it, it means something becomes useless for the purpose intended. We often use the analogy of a battery in a car. A battery is dead. Your car won't start. Your car won't run. But the battery didn't cease to exist. Right. It's still there. It's dead. It's useless for the purpose intended. There's no life that uh, that comes from that. So in the the in the sense that we okay, so we're a triune being, mm -hmm. spirit, soul, yeah. and body. Um, now there is no, most definitely a corruption of the body, a corruption of the soul. We have often talked about the spirit yeah. being unclean, and I would suggest it's not that it's literally dirty, but it's unclean in the sense of unrighteous because it chose to commit sin in obedience to God. It is unrighteous in that sense. It's not dirty, and it needs a filter, <laughs> mm -hmm. air filter. Um, it's unclean because it's unrighteous because of the actions it had taken. I'm not so right. sure about the spirit of man. I'm not sure the spirit of man is corrupted. Um, well, do you except think so? for one verse uh, there in Corinthians, cleansing yourselves from all filthiness of the soul and, 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 oh, and spirit, yeah. if, if I remember. Yeah. It says. The, the other thing, again, thinking about dead, uh, you know, we often quote, uh, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And, and we actually use an extended meaning of that and the way that we em, em, employ it uh, to the second death. Well, that's, that's true, but in the context, uh, it's, it's, it has to do with our walk and our life in Christ in this Romans chapter 6, uh, verse 19. He says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. So there's the, there's the choice in, in our walk. We can we can take this body and and yield to it, 
Paul told us in Romans 7, there's nothing good in this body. Uh, and, and he said, you know, what do I do with this? He said, I think, you know, where do I get victory in this? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So here he's talking about making the choices, servants, talking about clean service and righteous service. He said, for when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Well, before we were regenerated, if you will, before we were converted, before we trusted Christ, there was no righteousness that we could perform. Zero. Not one righteous act. We were free from righteousness. It wasn't expected of us. It couldn't be expected of us. Because the only way we could get it is for God to impute it and to give it to us. He said, what fruit had ye then in those things which whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. End of, of what things? Well, living in iniquity, following the flesh. He said, now being made free from sin. Well, how are we made free from sin? Sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. Because we're not under the law, we're Amen. under grace. And become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, and here the wage of, of sin is death. And pursuing the flesh and living in the flesh and following after iniquity, our service is what dies. Mm -hmm. it's, it's dead. We're not... We're like that battery. We don't cease to exist, but we're not performing the function that God has designed us to perform. And that comes as we, you know, he's, as he told Timothy, to lay hold on eternal life. That's what we do. The gift of God is eternal life. And that eternal life began the day we trusted Christ as our Savior. Yep. It's not something we're looking forward to when we die, although it is. It's much more than that. It is yep. it's something that we needed to embrace and, and realize that it empowers our lives from the day that we're saved, from the right. day we trust Christ. And, right. to, and, and to not avail ourselves of that is to be dead. Right, right. Uh, so, I th I, so in teaching, we're made of three parts. It seems like it's an interesting concept to want to make that connection between, you know, the triune, three deaths. Mm. I get that. But the Bible only speaks of the first death and the second death. Mm. Uh, so I wouldn't I wouldn't say anything beyond what what's already said in scripture, yeah. and right. for all the reasons Hal just shared, uh, there's there's really not a not a reason to to think about a third death in a, in a sense, um, um, but that's a that's a great question, and that's you know those kinds of questions I remember growing up I I, I would have questions like that, right. and then I'm, I have to study it out, and I'm right. like. Mm. yeah. Well, again, I I wouldn't say before a person is saved. And, and a lot of senses that they're, I don't know how I want to express this, but the idea we're, we're spirit, soul, and body before we trust Christ, our, our, our soul is completely and totally linked with our flesh. We don't have the ability to, to live after the spirit whatsoever. But when a person trusts Christ, it, it seems to me what we see in Scripture is that our soul then becomes bound to the Spirit through the Spirit of God. And so you've got this spiritual aspect that you were totally lacking of yeah. before we trusted Christ. Um, actually, in, in order to comprehend the understanding of Pauline doctrine and your position in heaven, um, I mean, in terms of... Pauline doctrine, your position in heaven, I, you know, you are complete in him in the sense that you're perfectly righteous as his son. You've already seated in the heavens. Right. Uh, and understanding Pauline doctrine is certainly crucial to know uh, the certainty of your salvation and yeah. uh, the uh, destination, after your destination after it's all over. Um, and, yeah, Paul does talk a lot about death, so there's, um, there's a lot to study there. Um, I, I can't think of it. I, I can't think of anything else to say. So if you have any other follow up, let me know. I don't I hope that you felt like we 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 addressed that thoroughly. Uh, Sean Davis, my brother, what's going on? All right. Tough question. He says the judgment seat of Christ works to be evaluated, apply to building up our inner man with knowledge or our outward deeds or both. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. 
Well, it's that obvious. was a question I had for many years. Yeah, was, well, the chapter three in First Corinthians is pretty clear about what's being judged there. It's it's works. So uh, <laughs> it's the quality of the works. Uh, those of poor quality are like wood, hay, and stubble, and they're burned. Those that are of the quality that God would esteem would are uh, gold, silver, and precious stone. Um, so it, it's work. And again, you, you, you're you not going to come to a complete understanding just reading that one passage. You right. read everything that, that, that right. Paul, right? And you realize how works that God esteems come from the life of God in us right. and not from the, any effort that we would have in the flesh. Um, the... Uh, so in the in chapter in First Corinthians three, you get this emphasis on works, works based upon what Paul had taught. But then you get yeah. to chapter four, First Corinthians four, and you get to a verse like five. Yep. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Well, and this is how we know that the judgment seat of Christ will take place at the rapture. Yeah. And then he says, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise, praise of God. God. So you have not just an emphasis on the outward works that you've done, but also the inward counsel of the heart, the motivation behind that work yeah. you did, which will factor into, I'm sure, the reward that you will get. Uh, or rewards, depending mm -hmm. upon how you how you view that, and then it ends with, and then shall every man have praise of God. Yeah. Now, he the hidden things of darkness, you know, the things done in secret will be manifest in the sense that those works are going to be judged and burned up, and then you have make manifest the counsels of the heart, you know, the the reasoning behind what you did will also be exposed hmm. and that will i think play a large role in determining degree of reward but then after it's all over with and then shall every man have praise of god is that god praising you or are you praising god yes mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um and the the point here how i remember how making this point years ago was just that every man have praise of god that's god praising you can you even fathom such a thing? God praising you for those good works. God is thrilled and happy with you for your faith in his son. God's thrilled and happy that you're studying his word. You're trying to apply his will to your life. And he's thrilled with the fruit that you produce as a result of your studies. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, we often get so wrapped up in our own mistakes and failures and, and sins that we do, we forget often about how happy God is with us for our faith, for our life, for studying, for being involved in all the, and for the good works that we try to do and the motivation that we do it. And he's looking forward to praising you for the good that you've done in your life. That's hard for me to wrap my head around. I'm, I'm, maybe some of you are like me. I'm quick to beat yeah. myself up over mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but here it's just it's hard to fathom. God's going to be praising you when it's all over. So when at the judgment seat of Christ, I don't know how, I highly doubt it'll be all that horrifying mm -hmm. and it's going to end with nothing but praise and glory. Yeah. And um, I just, I, 1 Corinthians 4, 5, it just is a verse that still sticks yeah. out with me. I'll tell you another good verse that I get, I get light and comfort from. In writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 5, Paul made this statement. He said, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment. Talking about the judgment of the church, you know, and how the church is to uh, judge and in some cases even exclude people from the assembly because of, because of their sin. And he said, in some men, they follow after. Right. Well, why do they follow after? Well, if, if it's if it's secret, nobody knows about it. There's not going to be any judgment, but there ultimately will be judgment. But then he then this next verse, and I and I I really like this verse. He said, "Likewise, also the good works 
of some are manifest beforehand. Amen. And they that are otherwise cannot be hid. Amen. Yep. And so when yep. I read 1 Corinthians chapter 4, God leaves no stone unturned to reward us for those things that perhaps we did and nobody ever even noticed. Right. The, the issue was in the faithfulness of the steward. Moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That's where that passage begins with. He's talking about faithful service. And, uh, you know, I, again, that that causes us to question why some why do some people want to serve in the church or they want public office or church office or something? Uh, and and it's because they want to be seen. And God's not impressed with that. What he's impressed with is is, is the the inner character and the life and the inner man with the life of Christ. That's uh, what he rewards. I, I love that. I love that so much. I wish I could go back and replay it all over again, brother. That was good. Well, it'll be in the archive. <laughs> <laughs> Toby Covington, my brother. Furtick is in the long list of mega church false teachers. That's right. It's questionable who's worse, he or Joel Osteen. I think they're in the same on the same mm. team. Uh, I don't know. Does Joel wear pink? <sighs> I don't know. I don't he looks so. like a pink wearing kind of guy. Uh, John uh, Chandler says, I'm just not up to speed on voice to text yet. No, 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 brother. I think voice to text is not ready for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's not ready for anybody mm. yet. Mm. It's not up to speed for anyone. Uh, Glenda's in the house. How you doing, sister? Uh, Chandler says, can I wear that sweater after I've gone through bed? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Cambo's in the house. Grace and peace to the body. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, Lori Loves Green, number nine, looking up. I love you. I hope you're doing great. Looky there, beloved Josie's in the house. Mm -hmm. Our sweet sister, great to see you. Uh, Toby says, I only drink a gallon a day. Exactly. Yeah. Me too. Uh, uh, how said alcohol is anesthesia. Boy, howdy. <laughs> uh, that's true. I, in fact, mm -hmm. um, uh, I was before I when I was away from the Lord. I could I, there was no sleep for me at all. I was just so full of depression, anxiety. I drank a lot just so I could sleep. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really true. And then the drinking was so bad. I, it really wasn't a great night of sleep because I'd wake up in the middle of the night and mm. I would down a gigantic glass of water, mm. like a big mug of water, and just drink it all in one one go so it wouldn't have a horrific hangover in the morning. Yeah. And then you drink another glass of a yeah. giant mug in the morning. And then you might be able to be halfway productive that day. Um, horrific. Yeah. I hated it. Um uh, John, are you the white bearded guy on your Facebook pic? You look very wise and intimidating. That's right. Um, Uncle Ike was a preacher back in the 1800s and early 1900s. Um, if Satan is bound, are the other fallen angels? Satan will be bound at the Lord's second coming, and it will mm -hmm. last for a thousand, a thousand years. years. Yep. And then after that thousand years, he'll be loosed for a season. And the amazing thing at the end of that reign to me is the mass, I mean, mass number of people that follow yep. him yep. in deception and turn on the Lord. And they actually will surround Mount Zion and mm. the promised land and they will threaten the people. Mm. Um, and you have this big epic showdown and God will say a few words to Satan and then fire will come down and consume all those people, mm -hmm. and that'll be it. Yep. That'll be it. Um, uh, one faith, one Lord, one Bible says, on the coffee topic, most sound preachers I know drink coffee. Calvinists and he's don't. Uh, I'd say coffee is good for the spirit. I totally agree. And you know what? Cheers to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Coffee. Yeah. Well, when I teach first hour, I usually have my coffee cup up there with me. Uh, God help you if, if Carl watches you drink coffee. He will yeah, <laughs> lose well, his mind. I, I'm, I can handle it. Um, yeah, it was funny. He was giving David Reed grief about that the other a uh, couple of weeks ago. I laughed my head off. 
So, I laughed my head off. So it's okay to have a water bottle up there and take a sip. No, of, no, of, of, he doesn't like that either. He yeah. doesn't like that either. So if you're about to uh, pass out from dehydration, you know, you, <laughs> you, uh, you no, I, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, Jordan was very opposed to even water. Really? You know, yeah, Jordan was opposed to water. In fact, uh, that one, that one Wednesday when he just surprisingly showed up here, mm -hmm. uh, that was that was a pointer he gave me about the coffee I was drinking while I was behind the pub. But he's yeah. like, you need to just get rid of that and mm -hmm. drink everything you need before you get up and preach. No okay. drinking behind the pulpit. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but uh, usually that's something you can do for yourself while you're waiting for yeah. everybody to turn yeah. to the. <laughs> yeah. So, don't you still have your coffee in the pulpit with you on Wednesday nights? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that admonition I, sort of fell on deaf ears. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and I'm still writing out the sermons too, which yeah. I, is a source of consternation for him. Also, mm -hmm. uh, last last January, he's like, "Well, when you grow up, this is what an outline looks like," you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love me some Pastor Jordan. Yeah. He needs to get out of Ezekiel 38. We need to get into 40 and 41, 42. Come on, man! I can't wait. Mm -hmm. Bring it. Uh, the saint is being too hard on themselves. That's right. Prioritize life with humility can answer a lot of problems. Doctrine of humility. Amen. Mm. I love that. I could not agree more. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. John says, if I don't have coffee, I have a headache. Must be the addiction. <laughs> <laughs> there, can't, there are mm. uh, nasty consequences to a hardcore addiction to coffee. That's for sure. Um, Josie says, let's be honest, life can get stressful after volitionally making foolish decisions. Look at that fancy $5 word here, volitionally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But doctrine is the answer in simplicity, Proverbs and Romans to face life with reality. Yeah. That was fantastic. Yeah, well, that's that makes a very good point. Volitionally <laughs> making foolish decisions. In other words, you know that the that the choice is foolish. Yeah. And you're going to willfully do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Cambo says coffee. The reason I'm not a Mormon. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yes, I'm addicted to coffee. I need help. Toby says mm -hmm. um, there was uh, one guy. Um, I, I know a saint who uh, was telling me, I, uh, you know, we, he, he was over at the house. I asked him if he wanted some coffee and uh, he, he did not drink coffee. Because he didn't like coming under the control of anything, being relying on anything, dependent upon anything, coming under the control of anything. Um, you know, again, I guess people are different. I've never been controlled by coffee. I can take it or lease it, leave it. I drink it because I, I like it. I, I enjoy it. I don't. I've gone and, and do go from time to time um, stretches without drinking any coffee. I don't drink it because I have to have it. Yeah. Uh, now, food. Yeah, I have to eat. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you you, you got to do that. You yeah. don't have you have a choice about what you eat, but and you can go without it, but not for very long. Sa same thing's true with sleep. But yeah. you know, coffee being something that controls your life, I can't imagine that being true for anyone. Bob says, I must admit that I took great joy over the John Piper thing about drinking coffee while imbibed on the rest of my piping hot coffee. <laughs> Amy Stewart says, I hate coffee, but I like the smell of it. Yeah, the same yeah. is true for me in pipes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. pipes or, or yeah, a pipe smells good. My grandfather I, smoked a pipe. I just, I would love to do a pipe, but I just, that flavored tobacco thing, it's just, oh, it's awful. Yeah. I, yeah. oh. My grandfather, he would smoke this sweetest smelling, I, and I would go into his house as a young child, and I still, in my, I can still smell it. And it smelled good enough to eat, you know? I yeah. mean, it was really. Oh, the uh, flavored tobacco is awful. Yeah. It, the taste is just horrific. I, I, you know, well, he liked it. Now they have non-flavored tobaccos you could use for pipes, but I, you know, I've I've given that all up. But you know, it's just I can I, I like pipe, you know, Sherlock, and I just it's something to do while you're thinking about scripture and what yeah. you're going to say and write. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. oh, I love it. Uh, Amy yeah. Stewart wants us to go to James two. Would you pastors please discuss James two twenty one to twenty six? Unfortunately, I can't stick around, so I'll catch up later. No worries. Um, 
Yeah, James too. No, that is great fun. Uh, James two twenty one was not Abraham our father. Well, I feel like I should go back back it up. I mean, this is a major section here. Mm -hmm. um, do you think maybe I should just jump back to verse fourteen and go to the end, maybe? Or all right, let's start in verse fourteen. What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you, give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Well, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Um, there's a key verse there, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou, a vain man, mm -hmm. that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works? And by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was counted, imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Mm -hmm. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit of, is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Yeah. There you go. Uh, faith without works is dead. Does it mean that it ceases to be faith? Does it mean that works are required in order to become justified? No. Again, if you're going to use the book of James, that if man keep the, the whole law and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. The, to me, the, one of the key phrases that you see in the book of James, and you see it over and over and over and over again, ye see, thou seest, seest thou. And it's very much from man's perspective. See, uh, let's see where it was. Uh, seest ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Mm -hmm. We judge from the outward. God judges from the inward. The Bible tells us over and over again that God knows the secrets of the heart. He, he knows a person's true character and true motiva motivation. We do not. Uh, you see then how that by works a man is justified. You ever question, I wonder if that person is saved or not. Well, how would majority of people are going to judge that person on whether or not they think they're saved or not by the way that they live. Yep. That happens so much in Christendom. It's, it's crazy. That's, in, and it, in, it, yeah. yeah. And, it's, and but again, let's face it, other than a person's spoken testimony, the only evidence that you would have since you can't see the heart is what you see on the outside. And so in that sense, ye see then how that by works a man is justified. That's how you see. That's not how God sees and not by faith only. So uh, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. And in that particular sense, you know, uh, Sayest thou have faith, you know, uh, well, even even the devil has faith and, and believes. It's it's the evidence of that. It's not just the substance, but the mm -hmm. evidence. And I, from man's point of view, the evidence is outward. Uh, I, you know, key to me for this whole chapter is the fact that James quotes Genesis 15, just as Paul quotes Genesis 15, which explained how Abraham was justified. Yeah. In verse 23, he says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, yeah. and he was called the friend of God. Right. Justification, he, he's making the case here, justification is by faith, which is what 
Paul used that right. same verse to make that right. case. Right. Um, before God. Right. And then in the verse before that, he says, Seeth thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Yeah. You know, the, the, he, the point is, is the him seeing evidence of their faith through their works. Mm. That was the point. This chapter was never, it was not about mm. justification. He reinforces that same verse Paul does. Mm-hmm. So then this is about the perfection of your faith through works and works being an integral part of the prophetic program in Israel. I mean, it was integral. You needed to do works. Christ was telling you to do stuff. You had to come to God by faith in Christ. Absolutely. Beginning with John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. But after that, there were works that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. You needed to get repent and be water baptized. Mm -hmm. You needed to give up all your possessions and follow him. You needed, you needed to do stuff in order to bring about the kingdom. Thus, it makes perfect sense to me that James would be emphasizing works and seeing mm. evidence of people's faith through their works. That was an integral part of the yeah. program. But, it was, mm. you know, as we said, it was, again, always a matter of ju- the justification was always by right. faith, even in the gospel period. Well, some like to focus on that phrase, by works was faith made perfect. Right. All right. Well, what does that mean? Some people try to equate that perfection that they see in that verse as being righteousness, being justification. He says here that faith is perfected by works. It's not talking about imputed righteousness being received because of works. He's talking about something entirely different. I I use it for understanding as a cross-reference, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ in in Hebrews 5. It says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation Mm -hmm. unto all them that obey him. So how was the Lord Jesus Christ made perfect? Right. Was it through his works? Right. It was the demonstration. Right. Um, You have a lot of people would point out verse 21 was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he had offered up Isaac, Mm -hmm. his son, upon the altar. Right. Now, that's an interesting expression because, Mm -hmm. you know, he quotes later in verse 23, Genesis 15. What was when when God said in Genesis 15 that Abraham was just he was his faith was counted for righteousness. That was long before he tried to sacrifice Isaac. He was already justified before we even get to that story of him sacrificing Isaac. So it's an interesting proposition that he puts here, was not Abraham our father justified by works? In other words, was not, and I I think the point here is that was not the evidence of his justification by works perfected when, when he saw, when he offered up Isaac his son. You know, you saw Absolutely. You, when you read that story of Abraham and Isaac, you know good and well he was ju- he was faithful. Hmm. He was justified by his works. He, you knew he was justified through his works. Yeah. I should say, and I suspect that's the point there. I suspect. Right. I, well, again, I, I think of God's very own words right there in Genesis twenty-two concerning Abraham, where he's about to kill him. He said, right. "Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do." Thou anything unto him, for now I know. Right. For now I know that thou fearest God, right. seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only right. son from me. Again, right. it, was he justified at that time? No, he was already righteous. Right. So in, in what way <laughs> did God know? Right. Right. It, it was He allowed Abraham to do the outward expression, which affirms the truth to God and teaches Abraham something as well. Right. And I think um, the, uh, you know, it's the, it's the, you know, of course it's the works that get judged at the, for us, the judgment seat and for the unbelievers at the, at the great white throne. Mm -hmm. And this is why I think just going back to what we were talking about earlier with Satan being loosed for a little bit. God's going to bring down fire on them. It's a judgment of their works when they turn on him. He's not going to bring fire down on them because he knows in their heart they're not faithful. He's going to let them do something that expresses that unbelief and then bring judgment upon that. Mm. And that is that thus the works are not up for debate. (laughs) You did this. 
not up for debate. And therefore, he is justified to carry out mm -hmm. justice on those works. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a theme that goes all the way back into prophecy. This right. idea, you know, when you get to the great white throne, the book is open. Well, that book is it's the book of life. Yeah. And the books. Yeah. Well, what are the what are the books? The books are the records of a person's works. And it tells you right in that every man's work is going to be judged at that particular time. That's what's in the books. You go back uh, as early as, as, as Daniel, and uh, you see Nebuchadnezzar, and he recognizes God for who he is and testifies to that fact. And you get into that same passage, and, and prophecy talks about the ultimate judgment at the conclusion of all the world powers and it says, and the books were opened. And so prophecy foretells that time uh, where men are going to be held accountable uh, in that sense for their works. I love that. Yeah, that was phenomenal, Amy. I loved that. Mm -hmm. That was great fun. Uh, hey, Cheryl Cox is in the house. What's going on? Can't wait to learn something new again today. Me too. Mm -hmm. What you got mm -hmm. for me? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I guarantee you we learn as much mm -hmm. uh, as you guys. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. There is nothing, I, I, nothing that brings more excitement and joy in my life than after 60 some odd years in the faith to open up the word of God on a given day and see something that I never saw before. Yep. Yep, and it still happens. It it just it it gives me goosebumps. Uh, I find that to be one of the most rewarding things in my life. Um, the uh, I think we. Mm -hmm. I know I've got something here. Nothing here either. Where's the? Maybe it's here. Not there. Uh, and we got, you're mumbling. I'm totally, oh, okay. Let me see here where we have, oh, the Christmas star. All right. So I was getting my notes out for the next, oh, she's cleaning. That's why she closed the door. She's cleaning. Yeah. Oh. Wanted to get a little bit, get a little bit of cleaning in early. Uh, Joel and how can you do an ex exegesis on his star in Matthew two that led the wise men from the East? Do you think it was actual celestial star or an angel? I do have thoughts on this. Now, my grandfather years my grandfather was a right divider. He had years ago written a book called the Christmas story. It's not possible to get it anywhere anymore. Um, and I treasure the few copies that I have at my home. Uh, but one of my favorites thing, he dedicated the whole chapter to the wise men and the star. So uh, that subject has a lot of uh, sentimental value to me. Uh, so, you know, what I'll share basically is my grandfather's, what my grandfather taught me. And if he's wrong, I just totally blame mm -hmm. him. What was the deal with a star? Mm -hmm. Now, some talk about, and then we go through this every year at Christmas time, they talk about an alignment of Jupiter and Saturn, but we've all, dis everybody, most people usually dismisses that idea that this could have been a star that, this kind of thing could have been a star that led the uh, three wise men to find the baby Jesus. And why is that? Because of Matthew 2, 8, 9. Matthew 2, 8 says, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. Mm. And when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. I think that's Herod talking. Mm -hmm. And when they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And I think what you're looking at is, is, is something miraculous. Here. It's well, not, it's, it's obvious. It, I mean, it this, floated right in front of them, yeah. and it floated right over the child. Yeah. It went before before them. them. They they didn't they didn't just see it in the distance right. and go towards it. Right. They followed it. Right. And if that were true, that they were just following something from a distance that they had seen, 
when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When, when did they rejoice? When, when, it, when they followed it and it was uh, floated and it was right over the, right, right, stood right, over where and, the young and, child and was. And took them to the destination right. where the child is. And notice that the multiple references of the young child here. He was not an infant, not a baby. No, no. He had already grown mm. to a point of being a child by the mm. time the wise men found him. So the, mm. uh, the, uh, they never they never went to visit him in the manger, as you often see at Christmas time. But, um, you know, and it is true. It, you, you made a great connection there in the sense that a star is sometimes used as uh, as used to describe angels. That's that's very true. Um, it's possible. Yeah. I, w- I w- you yeah. know, I wouldn't dismiss it outright. Yeah. It's very possible yeah. to me. I kind of. um and I could be wrong here, but I always kind of equated the star with that miraculous pillar of fire that led the Israelites in the wilderness, that kind of a thing. Um, so, uh, but it's possible. I, w- I wouldn't, I wouldn't fight with anybody on that. But it, in my mind, I'm just picturing a kind of pillar of fire, like a star, floating in front of them because wilderness. Um. I think, uh, you know, it would be if it was an angel, they would have it probably would have said so, because in this whole um, in this whole period here, you have multiple appearances of angels and the and the uh, all the gospel accounts were really straightforward about saying that it was an angel. You get to, you know, dis- descriptions of angels as stars in places like Revelation and Psalms, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so that might be another reason. Um, um, let me get back over here. All right. Uncomfortable silence, Fred would say. Uh, James was written, uh, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Toby said, yep. Very good. Very good. Vincini, please pray for me. Everyone is driving me nuts today. I'm hyper irritable and try not to lose it at work. All right, so, yeah, quote yourself scripture and meditate on those scriptures. Mm -hmm. Been there, done that many times. In fact, uh, when I was, um, when I came back to the Lord, one of the things, one of the problems I had, I would get these mental rages. And um, Mm -hmm. one of the ways that I would combat that after I came back to the Lord and I was studying all over again is I quoted scripture to myself. And in fact, I quoted Ephesians 4.32 often Mm -hmm. in that state. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And in fact, the that uh, I, I never I never focused on kind and tenderhearted toward everybody, but I always focused on the end where the where Paul says that God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Mm-hmm. You know, as mad as you are about everybody else, let's you know the point was don't forget about the fact that you have screwed up many times yourself and God the Father has already forgiven mm-hmm. you. He didn't even forgive you for your sake, he forgave you for his son's sake. Mm-hmm. Because his son died for you on that cross. Mm-hmm. And I found that verse to be for me unbelievably humbling. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like a cold slap to the face. What are you mm-hmm. mad at these other people for when you are have have made as many if not worse mistakes than them? And mm-hmm. um and and you need to check yourself. Yeah. And the the other aspect to it too that helped me in my thinking with unbelievers, uh, because I was you know in the early days before doing this, I was working part-time at a restaurant, and there was a lot of unbelievers in that restaurant doing <laughs> a lot of bad things. Yeah. And I thought to myself, this would be a great experiment to see how well you can handle yourself mm-hmm. with unbelievers, hardcore, carnal mm-hmm. unbelievers. And see, um, you know, how well you can hold up under that pressure. And one of the mm-hmm. things that Jordan said that really uh, clicked with me was, was, um, you know, why should we be surprised about unbelievers acting like unbelievers? Yeah. That that change mm-hmm. in my thinking was really effective too. Well, I happen to remember that time, and I know one of the methods that you were using to cope with that situation. And I was going to say this. He said. Pray for me. Everyone is driving me nuts today. I'm hyper irritable and trying not to lose it at work. And one of the things that I learned and experienced back when I did work in a that type of environment 
If you want to get over your irritation with something, with somebody, go do something nice for them. Yes. Yes. Go do something nice for them. Yes. Yeah. Help, do something that makes their job easier. Take them a cup of coffee. Give them a candy bar. Just go over and pat them on the back and, and, and say something positive. Yep. Do something nice for that person. If you want to get over your irritation with their whatever, do something for them. Yeah, there was some. I remember one occasion in which uh, there was somebody working there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one guy, uh, the one manager who uh, has multiple degrees in psychology, was like, "Man, she's she's a shark, and she would eat her own. She is, I mean, tough." Yeah. And uh, so I want to. I tried to do nice things for her whenever possible. Yeah. If I could go, if I could do some show some grace to her, mm -hmm. I would. Mm -hmm. And one day I came in and uh, she had done this enormously kind thing to me. Mm. And uh, I remember she did something before. She kind of did something that really upset people. And uh, I, I was kind of annoyed at something she did. And then I came, and she did all this grace to me, showed me enormous grace in something she did. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a great illustration of grace itself. Totally mm -hmm. changes the way that you view that person. Because mm -hmm. when somebody shows you grace, doing something nice for no reason at all just to do it, Oh, that kind of changes the way you mm -hmm. view that person and the yeah. way that person views you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't help but want to, you can't help but feel grateful. You can't help but want to do something kind in return. It makes a, all the difference in the world. So I, I, I really loved what you said, Hal. I couldn't agree more. Somebody irritates you, do something nice to them. Show them some grace. I love that point. Um. John says, some days I thank God for bedtime. <laughs> I never mm -hmm. was a fan of sleep. I never, I never, uh, sleeping was never easy for me. And uh, I thank God if I, if, if my eyes open up in the morning and there's uh, even a faint hint, hint of light in the windows, I'm out of bed. Can't wait to do some work. Mm -hmm. I would much rather mm -hmm. be awake doing this. Yeah. I also think of uh, Galatians chapter six where he says, let us not be weary in well-doing. Yes. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not, as we therefore, as we have therefore opportunity. Yeah. Let us do good unto all men. Amen. Especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Amen. I love that. So, you know. I love that. Yes. Opp opportunity. So, you know, instead of focusing on the things that are happening to us that irritate us, maybe we need to be looking for opportunities in order to do good to all men. Uh, Vincenti says, it just feels like the Groundhog's Day movie. <laughs> I have a guy right behind me that eats literally all day with his mouth open, storing food in his cheeks as he eats. It's so loud and so gross. Yeah, I understand. Then a 30-plus-year-old man near me that whistles, stomps his feet, and sings all day, and then randomly explodes, threatening to punch people, and no one does anything about any of it. It's a weird place around here. Yeah. It's been years and years of the same thing, and some days I just feel like I can't do it anymore. To combat that, show grace. And in fact, uh, a lot of times, uh, a lot of time was spent trying to figure out how to show grace when I was at that, at that restaurant. Um People would try to challenge me. I was slow to respond to try to think of a gracious response to that mm -hmm. speech, all way with grace, truth and love. It doesn't matter what people do. It doesn't matter how they act, how they behave. What matters is you applying the principles of grace to the details of your life. How do you do it? What does it look like? What is it? What does it sound like? How, how are you going to be able to achieve these things in yourself? Uh, cause you can't control them. Unbelievers are going to act like unbelievers, but what you can do is exemplify the very attributes of grace in your interaction with them. And, uh, so that was the thing for me. That was the thing I had to focus my mind on while I was working. And what do I do? How can I do it in a way that's, uh, well, well and don't get the wrong idea. I wasn't, I wasn't always perfect. I wasn't always perfect, but, uh, you know, you got to try. You got, you got to start somewhere. You got to try. You got to think it through. And it's all about manifesting that grace in you, living that life of grace, showing people that grace so that they can see in you the grace you have already found in Christ. 
Um, so I love that you brought this up, Vincent. Thank you very much for that. That mm -hmm. was that was great. Um, hey, Cliff Matthews, my beautiful brother. Hey, there he is. Hey, great to see you. How's life? How's the family? I wonder how different uh, Chandler says, I wonder how different our bodies will be compared to the angels body when glorified. That's a great thought. Mm. I, I don't know. I don't know. I know that our human bodies, he, he said being made a little lower than the angels. So in the divine order of things, if you look at an angelic body and the current body that we inhabit, it's described as being a little lower than the angels to yeah. a lesser degree. Uh, the, and people say, well, what does that mean? Well, I think of things that, that angels probably do with ease. Uh, we do with, if we can duplicate it with a great deal of more difficulty and effort, you know, for instance, angels fly, can man fly? Well, yeah, but not naturally, <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an artificial, um, uh, type of thing. But when we get a body that is to be fashioned like his glorious body, uh, when we are to be, you know, uh, clothed upon, uh, by, by his body, when we're giving that body that's eternal in the heavens, I, I can't think that it's going to be anything inferior about it. Yeah. I mean, if it's going to be fashioned like his body, how could it be inferior to, to anybody? Uh, I completely agree. Uh, probably apples and oranges. Hey, we got KJB believer in the house. How you doing? Do you believe the rapture is intimate, i.e. it can happen at any moment? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yep. And I don't believe that because the, of the circumstances, the things going on in the no. Middle East, uh, geopolitics. I don't believe um, even technology doesn't lead me to think that the rapture is intimate. I do it because Philippians 4, 5 tells me the Lord is at hand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the doctrine of eminence uh, found in that yeah. one verse. Yeah. I believe it's as imminent today as it was in, in the day of Paul. Uh, he definitely looked for the imminency of it in his lifetime. Yep. But until then, now is our salvation even nearer yep. than when we believe. That's right. And, the, uh, I, and, and I also think, well, somebody might be thinking, well, how could it be? You know, how could it have been imminent in Paul's day? Clearly it wasn't because we're still here. It was always in, in, imminent because I think Romans 11 mm -hmm. and the fig tree was the continuation of the age of grace was always conditional upon the Gentile response. Mm -hmm. um, learned that from Jordan, and that makes a lot of sense to me. So it was, it was mm -hmm. always imminent. It was, mm -hmm. and, it was, and it was conditional. Um, but his long suffering is really long. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, he's mm -hmm. got way more long suffering than I do. Yep. Praise the Lord. He's the Lord and not yeah. me. We'd have burned everybody to a fairly <laughs> well a long time ago. I, age of grace after, yeah. after Pentecost yeah. age of grace. I said, no, no, no. Forget yeah. about this age of grace. I want to burn yeah. them now. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. God's amazing. Uh, Toby says, can someone really keep the law? If we have sinned once we break the law. Has anyone other than Christ in the flesh not sinned? Exactly. Nobody. Nobody. Uh, Peter said they couldn't even do it. Not to mention the fact, Toby, and that's a that's a great point. Not to mention the fact we we've been pointing out too. A recent thing I've learned is Galatians four four or two fourteen, mm -hmm. talking about how Peter was already uh, living after the manner of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. He had already abandoned the law yes. in Paul's day. Yep. So why should we do it when Peter wasn't right. even doing it? Right. Yeah. Carl said, Carl is in the house. I love you. I hope you're doing great. Uh, KJB believer, it's great to see you. One faith, one Lord, one Bible on the law question. I realize we're not under it, but isn't it still beneficial to teach that the law shall not kill, for instance? Um, well, Paul talks about that. He, he addresses nine of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. The one he doesn't address is keep the Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah. why not? Yeah. Why not do it? Uh, uh, why not uh, do the uh, yeah. uh, teach that yeah. out of Paul's epistles when Paul says, right. 
He said, in fact, doesn't he say all the laws fulfilled? Right. And even in one word. Right. Uh, that was uh, Romans 13. Yeah. Uh, for this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, mm -hmm. thou shalt not bear false witness. Uh, and then it is, and, and then he says at the end of that verse, Romans 13, 9, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill mm -hmm. to his neighbor. neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And so, okay, so... So you take, for example, 1 Corinthians 13, that gives you all the attributes of love. And you consider a circumstance, a conflict or something, and you consider, you, 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 you compare that to the attributes of love. How would love respond to that person and that circumstance? What would love say to that person? What would love do? And thus, you fulfill the law by living a life of true charity toward everyone. When you have love defining what you say, what you do, how you do it, you you naturally fulfill the law. And if you are you if you are in Paul's epistles and you allow the words of Christ to dwell in you richly, you allow yourself to yield to the guidance and the teaching of the Spirit and the Word. You'll inevitably you won't just fulfill the law. You will far exceed beyond whatever was required of the law. You would naturally do that by grace because you're, you're far more motivated to serve God now that he has brought about your redemption than you ever were living under the law. Yeah. And the law will only tell you one thing. You sinned. You yep. broke the law. Yep. You're a sinner. Yep. And, you're gonna, and if you're going to think about living under the law, you have to also reconcile this idea of, you know, the consequence of breaking the law. Right. And that, that, that consequence for breaking the law was satisfied at Calvary. Right. Well, and he, and he tells us there, as we, we looked at in Colossians, you know, he said that the law was contrary to us. Right. It's, it wasn't for us. It was contrary to us. He took it out of the way and he nailed it to his cross. So, Again, uh, yeah, now abideth faith, hope, charity. The greatest of these is charity. Yep. There's nothing that can be clearer on the subject than that. Amen. Uh, Robert Craig says that uh, 1 Timothy 6.16 is the survival of the soul at the death of the body different in some way from immortality. Um, yes, and I would argue that immortality in, is life with God in that sense. It is, it is taking part in the eternal life that is a part of God. Um, and I, I, if I remember correctly, that's what I taught years ago. Um, uh, well, but, in, in the context of, of eternal judgment, it says where the worm dieth, dieth not, not. The, the, the body is destroyed, but... There is uh, some kind of form that continues to exist. Yeah. Um, all right, let me read this verse here. Uh, Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Um who is it that you think, Pastor Hal, is dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto? <laughs> I think that's God the Father. Yep. Yeah. I knew you were going to say that. I could have said he was going to say that, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, now, let me see here. Um, I asked Hal that question so I could look up my notes. <laughs> okay, so Webster's definition of immortality. <coughs> The quality of never ceasing to live or exist. Exemption from death and annihilation. Life destined to endure without end as the immortality of the human soul. Jesus Christ who hath abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That was the verse I was thinking of and I was surprised when it was <laughs> this other one. That's, that's 2 Timothy 1.10. Mm -hmm. It's also exemption from oblivion. Perpetuity, existence not limited as the immortality of a corporation. So how is it 
that Christ or God the Father only hath immortality, and yet he brought to light our immortality through the gospel? That was, that was a question I had. Did not Christ die as we do simply because he bore our sins for us? Do not our souls live forever regardless yeah. of our eternal destination? I think this expression may fall under Webster's second definition of immortality in that it's perpetuity, existence not limited. In the, in the, in, um, the, and this goes back to, to uh, John 5 that in Christ is life himself, which has always existed from everlasting to everlasting. It's a quality that we can never claim for ourselves. He only is immortal in himself and has immortality as he is, you know, the, 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 the fountain of immortality, the, for the immortality of men and angels derived from him. And Fred had one time had said, as the son of man, he died, but as the son of God, he lives forever. He said that at men's breakfast, and I wrote it down. Uh, what's your What's your reaction to that? I don't have one right now. My my, <laughs> my brain was somewhere else. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's no problem. That's hilarious. Uh, Vincent, he says, I'm thankful the Bible defines love and then shows it perfectly through Christ. So many think it's just an emotional thing, but it's a self-sacrificial attitude of truth and what is right according to God. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And in those attributes of love in 1 Corinthians 13, mm -hmm. you know, love always wants what's best for everybody else. You know, and it's a servant to help that other person achieve right. what's best. Yeah. And if somebody uh, somebody yeah. else, something good happens for them, yeah. something positive, you rejoice with them. Yeah. You want that good stuff to happen. You're not envious and jealous because you yeah. love that person. You want good stuff to happen right. to that person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love that. Uh, Actually, if I, you know, I can interpret Philippians chapter two, we should probably experience even greater joy when good things happen to others than when they happen to us. I love what Norma says here. She says, "I always, I was always told, if you live by the law, you die by the law." Is that wrong? Well, there, there are uh, several passages of scripture. Uh, in fact, I think Paul said it, those that live by the law are going to be judged by the law. And again, if they, if they seek to be justified by the law, uh, they're going to reap what the law does, which is nothing but condemnation. Yep. Um, uh, Justin uh, quotes 2 Corinthians 3, 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Mm -hmm. We covered that um, yeah. Tuesday, I think it was. Mm. Uh, Davey says the main part of the question was, do we die three times in the sense that we're made of three parts? All three parts must die. Well, the one part is given to us from God and goes back to God when we die. So I would just stick with the first death and the second death as yeah. defined in Scripture. And I wouldn't talk mm. about a third death unless there was you know, a Bible verse that said third mm. death. I'm very yeah. I, I'm skittish about saying anything mm. that, where, in which I, I, it's you know you don't have a direct yeah. you you can't quote something from the scripture directly yeah. to make that case. Um, I can't think of a verse anywhere in the Bible that says that the soul dies. Uh, well, only in the sense of separation from God, right? Yeah. But I'm talking about yeah. dying in the sense of of ceasing to exist. Right, 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 right. It's like the body. The body's dust. It goes back to dust. It's it. That's it's gone. Huh. Not coming back. Norma Garcia says, I was finally able to load the thumb drive with Daisy's help. I've started reading your book. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I hope you enjoy it. My, the, the, the point of that book for me was understanding identification, knowing who you are in Christ. And when I understood that doctrine, it literally transformed my life. It was also a new source of just endless joy for me. And uh, something about identification that just never gets old either. Um, um, yeah, John Snodgrass quotes Ecclesi uh, Ecclesiastes 12.7, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and yeah. the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Um, Davy uh, quotes Hebrews 9, 27, and as it is appointed unto men once to die. What part of us that dies is the soul before you can be 
quickened with the Spirit. It is a death. You, I think once you reach the age of accountability and you sin as a responsible adult before God, you are then dead. You're a dead man walking because you've been cut off from his life because of sin. Um. Yeah, I like to. I like that on the uh, one faith, one Lord, one Bible. On the three death discussion, if our flesh dies, our souls either go with our spirit back to God, or or are separated and go down when the spirit returns. There's no spirit. Spirits in hell, only souls. Spirit is life, and that spirit, as Hal often mentions, it's the candle of the Lord. Yep. That spirit exists inside of you to confirm the fact mm. that God exists. You know that God exists. You know about the Godhead, the power, the fact that he created all things. We are without excuse because of the spirit that's within us. Mm. Uh, Glenda says, your thoughts on persons with Down syndrome in the age of accountability. I don't think any of them. I, I highly doubt any of them would be held accountable. Uh, it, I guess it would depend on the severity of the of the condition, but I don't think any of them are going to be held morally accountable for uh, what they've done because of their infirmity. The foundation of God stand is sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Yeah, and Shall will not the, the judge, judge of, of this all the earth all do right? right. He will, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, that was always the answer for anything for me growing up. Shall not the judge of this earth do right? Always, without exception. Um, hey, Anita's in the house. We're going to be seeing Anita soon. Yes, I know. Very excited about that. That's another reason for you to stay the whole summer. Uh, I stopped uh, for a moment to eat breakfast and say hello to our podcast friends. We will be at FBC on Sunday. Love you all. Um, uh, thank you, Saints, in the chat for adding to the conversation. Two cents from a saint is worth more than a million from a lost man. Exactly. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, and uh, two cents from a grace believer is worth more than a billion from most pre <laughs> priests and preachers. <laughs> the value of what a grace believer shares, uh, it's all good news. It's, it is you are helpers of their joy, helping people find joy to understand the truth of God and rejoice in it. And it's great fun. Helping people be happy. Yeah. Um, Norman says, I'm the same with coffee. I just like it. I don't have an addictive character. Thank God. I totally yeah. have one. My, my, when I gave up my addiction of alcohol, my new addiction was Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think that's, that's a, a little healthier. That's uh, Yeah. So it turned out to be way healthier for me. If tobacco wasn't bad, I'd smoke cigars and pipes. They smell so good. I know. I I, I did. I did not. After about ninety days, I didn't struggle with alcohol anymore. I still think of cigars often. Uh, never liked the smell of either tobacco or cigars. For some reason, it makes me sick. Uh, don't even like the smell of alcohol of any kind. Yeah, the smell of alcohol actually makes me queasy now. It. it I. I feel like getting sick when I smell it. Uh, James one one. J Harp. J Hop. I'll just say J. Hi. Hey, what's going on, brother? How you doing? A servant of God and the Lord and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes, which are scattered mm -hmm. abroad. Greeting. Exactly. Exactly. I would take everything in the collection of Hebrew epistles as being written to the little flock yeah. scattered abroad. Right. Um, uh, Cheryl says, rightly divided. Works are required of Israel as proof of their faith, but under grace, it's by faith alone. Right. And, you know, there you can apply a similar principle to grace in the sense that I know how justified the man loves his Bible. He teaches every week. He teaches uh, sound doctrine. He does enormous amounts of good work, and he hangs with us, you know. So he's got to have a lot of grace in him to be willing to hang out with all of us. I don't know. There was a, there, <laughs> there was one strike against me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. yeah. I know my wife's saved because she's got enormous grace. She loves the grace message. She studies her Bible every day. Mm -hmm. uh, she does good works all day, all night. She's amazing. Uh, so, uh, okay, so this question here on, uh, I don't know who Jonathan Burris is, uh, wrongly dividing. Uh, you know, my thing about, and uh, whoever he is, my thing is, I, I, I would, I actually love him. 
I don't know him, but I already love him. And my love, and I would, my prayer for him is that he would just simply come into the word rightly divided. A lot of, I mean, even if, okay, so even if he's saved and he is, uh, wherever it is he's coming from, he's already, he hates dispensationalists and mid acts dispensationalists. That's not uncommon. And a lot of that was just pounded into him from where he's coming from. He embraced a system that naturally hated dispensationalism mm-hmm. and he's just regurgitating a lot of stuff he's, mm-hmm. he's learned. And, uh, and so, you know, truth and love might steer him back. It doesn't matter who it is. The, the method mm-hmm. by which we would interact with anybody is always going to be the same. Love, you know, mm-hmm. uh, speech all way with grace, sharing those verses in order to persuade the naysayers, the gainsayers. Um. Uh, my grandfather gave my aunt and my uncle his book. Um, it was it was it was it was decent. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to uh, on Wednesday next week talk about the birth of Jesus. So I'm going through the Christmas story. I'll be quoting all the best parts of my grandfather's book. Uh, the, the the two things that were uh, uh, beloved, I really beloved. He uh, the first chapter was about the fullness of times. God sent His Son. And he talked about how perfect everything was to set the stage for the arrival of his son, the incarnation of his son. And I loved that. Every time I ride Spaceship Earth at Epcot, I think of that, you know, the whole communication. And then you get to the Roman Empire and you have peace and you've Mm -hmm. got all these roads. Communication has, you know, exponentially increased. And um, I I just that was phenomenal. Um, And then the star. Because I didn't never knew what to think about the star, my grand and my grandfather sent me on the on the right path about trying to figure out when uh, Jesus was born. That I t- I got a lot of help from him on that on those three points. Um, Chandler says I think I on- only I select few could actually see the star. I know the guards couldn't see it. Um, yes, thank you for that. Uh, agree, hundred percent. Joel just falling short today. Don't. Now, do not beat yourself up over falling short, making mistakes. Mm -hmm. What does Paul say in Philippians 3.13? Mm -hmm. Forgetting. Forgetting those things that are behind and reaching forth into those things that are before. Do not obsess about mistakes. Do not obsess about, okay, I tripped up. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not in the right state. Don't let it go. And what are you going to do? Uh, Reach forth under those things that are before. You still have time. You still have this opportunity in front of you. So you look at, keep moving forward, looking up and start looking at the future opportunities that you have and how to deal, how to deal with it. Yeah. If you're walking down the sidewalk and you're looking back from where you just walked, what's going to happen? Amen. You're going to walk out the street in front of a car. You're going to walk into a lamppost. You're going to do no. Um, Be, Be looking, looking up. Looking in the right direction. Yeah. And when grace believers act as non-believers, how about that? It's possible. That happened in my case. Mm-hmm. I was a grace believer, fell away, and there was a time, a long time, when you probably you could not have been able to tell any difference between me and anybody yeah. else. Uh, Dan the Man is in the house. How you doing? Uh, how I found the dung gate of New Jerusalem, Re- Re- Revelation 21, 22, 1, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Mm-hmm. There you go. How you doing, brother? It's great to see you. He also uh, quotes a number of verses here. Let me get, let me get through Chandler. and uh, um, Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Christ told Paul he would go to Rome, not eminent till then. Um, I don't. When Christ told Paul he would go to Rome, uh, I don't. I don't see any eminence in that in that moment. Do I? I don't know. I'm not sure. I know. I'm not sure. I, I fully get the question. It, maybe maybe rephrase it or something. So I, I'm not sure what to say to that. Uh, I'm sure it's a great point. Uh, one phase, you guys cleared up things greatly. Simply live as Paul taught using the law as a schoolmaster and Paul's epistles as life guidance. Totally agree. There's a it, real quick, my grandfather again. Uh, I've told this a million times, I know, forgive me. But, you know, when I was young, you know, he used to always uh, quote to me James. And it was James 119, if I'm not mistaken. 
uh, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. But actually, he would say, be, you know, be quick to hear, uh, slow to speak uh, is what he would usually say. And uh, finally, when I was in my early teens, I think I was maybe 12, 13, I read things that differ, lit my fire. And then um, we were already living down here in Florida. And so the next time my grandfather came to visit, he quoted that verse to me again. Swift to hear, slow to speak. And I, I said, Grandpa, uh, that's James 1. He's talking to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. That's not my mail. Yeah. And Grandpa said, okay, fine. Paul said, study to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> very true yeah. and that's how i learned timeless principles mm. uh, if it lines up with what's in paul's epistles it's timeless yeah. <laughs> yep love that story in any event uh okay so dan, back to dan the man he quotes psalm 65 4 blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Amen. And then he said, uh, 22, 22, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. So now I agree that we eat and go to the bathroom in heaven. All goodness proceeds out. Oh, I see. Okay. Um. And then he says, it's good to see Helen Joel. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. All glory to God. Well, thank you, brother. Hey, how do we get that free gift of eternal life? You know, I was in thinking about that. I think one of the greatest joys that you have as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ is the privilege to become what Paul says. He said, we're ambassadors. And, and I just love that passage in, in 2 Corinthians 5 where Paul says, all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, I know as a, as a lost person, uh, as, a, as a child, one of the, the greatest things that I anguished over was, did I really know who God is? And did he know who I am? Uh Am I at odds with him? How in the world can I become acceptable to him? Amen. I mean, that's yep. that's what a reconciliation is. Uh, we are supposed to be able to, rec based upon what God is doing and who God is, we have this message as, be as believers in Christ uh, of a message of reconciliation. And he explains it. He said, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So again, all men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're in our fallen state. We're, we're not acceptable to God. We're alienated from the life of God. And there's a reconciliation that needs to take a place between, between us and God. Well, he tells us that that's our message. How is it accomplished? Well, in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, he says, For he, talking about God the Father, hath made him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the reason that this reconciliation can take place. How we can go from being a person that the Bible describes as being lost to a person that the Bible describes as being saved. We become righteous in, in the sight of God. We are reconciled through him because the Lord Jesus Christ became sin for us. That's what the gospel is, Paul said in in. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's called the gospel. The gospel is good news. That's what you believe. That's the message of reconciliation. That's how you become reconciled to God. It's, it's not something that you're going to achieve on your own. You can, you can work all you want to. You can go to church all you want to. You can give away all your money. You can do all sorts of things. 
And that's not going to reconcile you to God. Uh, Paul says, it's to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. That's the issue. The, the issue is, is being righteous before God. That's what you need. Because in that state of righteousness, when it's given to you to God, you become reconciled with him. Um, Romans 4, Paul t- talks about the, the testimony of Abraham, how Abraham believed God. And because he believed God, it says, therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. You see, you need righteousness, and God will give it to you. It shall be given to you. It shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. If you want to be just before God, if you want to be viewed as righteous before God, if you want to be acceptable to God, if you want to be reconciled to God, It's by faith in that finished work that he accomplished for you. And in doing that, we receive the gift of eternal life. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But God commendeth his love toward us and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. All of that was done to accomplish your reconciliation with God. Amen. And that is our message today. All right, a couple a couple more comments, and then we'll pray. Uh, Joel, you changed, but what can you tell someone so they change their carnal ways? Um, for me, I had to hit bottom on my own, and I realized the life I was living was not right. I needed to change everything. And uh, it was a full-blown com- – I mean, I'm sitting in a jail cell from a DUI, and, and, and I'm sitting on the floor, and um, – still handcuffed behind my back and I'm thinking I need to change my life. And it was a full blown thousand percent commitment after that. Um, that's what it took for me. Uh, I also knew that I was already on a path, um, that was not good with the extensive drinking. Something had to give. Uh, so as far as helping somebody else, I think everybody's different and it just varies, but, um, you know, it, the only way I could change was through the word. And I had committed myself to absolutely studying his word, knowing Paul's epistles inside and out, front to back, uh, beginning to end. Um, so, you know, for, but if you want to persuade somebody to get back, I think I would still go through those three steps that we talk about. Uh, you know, you start with the gospel make sure they understand that. Number yeah. two, I think identification in and of itself is a great motivator. Give them the book. Give them, let them help them to come to understand who they are in Christ. I wouldn't threaten them with, you know, reaping what you sow and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, entice them with love and good news. Yeah. Um, I'd probably do that. And then also write, entice them with right division. Uh, I think it's just as easily somebody can turn because they are drawn toward the good news of who you are in Christ and drawn toward, uh, you know, under, helping, helping you to understand your Bible. That could work. That could work. Uh, but I think the word in and of itself would be the most effective tool. Um, but I think love and good news, you know, and, you, yeah. and in humble servitude, you're sharing with that person this yeah. great news. And, yeah, they just might react to that. They may not. The power of, the, mm. of sin in the flesh is extremely, mm. it's extremely powerful. Yeah. But It's more than telling someone. It's showing them. Yeah. Uh, Angela uh, Angela's in the house. How are you doing? I wish I could have had a grandpa like you. Well, he, he was a human <laughs> being like everybody else. That's for sure. Um, Lori and I were talking yesterday that my grandpa is largely to blame for the fact that I have inflicted myself on the grace movement like this. <laughs> well, everybody has uh, their know, millstone so, there. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know whether grandpa is going to get any reward for that, mm-hmm. but, um, um, it is a blessing to have mature men. A mature grace believer, male grace believer, woo, talk about rare. Yeah. That's a that's rare air they're breathing. 
Um, and uh, I, I would praise the Lord as much for any any guy who's a mature grace believer. Um, and um, that's unbelievable what you said about your grandfather. Unbelievable. Uh, she says, I'm so glad that I not only did I come to the Lord, but came to the knowledge of the truth in spite of where I came from. Yeah. Isn't that. Is that not amazing? Cause for rejoicing for all of us. Now, Lori and I, we both grew up in grace families, grace churches, uh, both of us. And we're just like, we're, you know, we have often talked about how lucky we've been. Yeah. And how can you not give back in ministry when you were born into the truth? Yeah. Um, um, and I love the fact that another aspect of that comment I love is just how the message of the cross and the great, the sound doctrines of grace both transform the way you view the people that wronged you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think that's that is also amazing. Nothing like the Word of God that can totally change how you view somebody who did you severely wrong. That's amazing. Uh, And uh, Norma Garcia, she says, uh, I am so very happy. My husband was very interested in hearing the study on Wednesday night. Oh, good. He wanted me to transfer it to the TV so we could listen together. (laughs) Boy, Um, he he is a glutton for punishment. (laughs) It is. um, Yeah, poor guy. Um, Were you wordy? Yeah. it was th- that message was really long, and I spent a lot of time scaling it back. Mm. And I finally got it to a place. I was done at uh, ten till, and mm. uh, but we had I had so much interaction. We had questions and thought, and we yeah. talked for a, a, just about yeah. ten minutes after yeah. that. Um, I, I get this the, the, talking about uh, the going through the Gospels is um, there's a lot of other guys doing that too. I think uh, Ted Fellows is going through John, uh, Tom Boucher, John Verstegen. No, John Verstegen's in First Peter. Um, yeah, there's you know, oh, Greg Reeser going through Matthew. And um, uh, I think it's um, endlessly satisfying. The Gospels is just enormously satisfying when you understand the word rightly divided. It's a thousand times more powerful. Um, all right, now I'll just close it with, uh, I love Jesus Christ, the Son of God, my reconciliation, my hope, my love, my desire, my example, my mentor, my everything. Amen. Amen. All right. How about a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, what Vincini said, <laughs> how we love you and love your son, and how we love this reconciliation that we have by grace, and how we love this life of joy that you've given us, and how we love the hope, the fact that we're freed from the law, <laughs> the fact that we can live a life of love, bring joy to others through the good news of what you revealed to us through Paul and how we love this life of grace you've given to us and how much joy that is continually comes back to us just living out your word. And Father, we just, uh, I lift up all the saints in the live chat, all the saints here, Pastor Hal, especially Marilyn, because she's uh, married to him, Uh, my wife, Lori, Pastor Freddie Bear, who, um, I uh, had a bad morning, and um, and Gwen also. I lift them all up, Father. I pray that we continue to just grow in wisdom and knowledge, in the in Your will, and we master the art of applying Your will to the details of our life, to the degree of that we are all just the image of Your Son. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, thank you so much. We'll be back here on Sunday morning with Pastor Hal. He's going to rock the house for Sunday school. What are you talking about? Hell. Hell. All right, we're going to be going through hell Yeah. Did, <laughs> Sunday morning. Well, <laughs> did, did Paul teach hell? Yep. Yeah. I love that. All right. Hey, uh, we'll see you then. Have a bad weekend. Take care, guys. Bye.